<laughs> it never works out. Poets, poets are ethereal, otherworldly, over-educated effetes who often intimidate the rest of us with their erudition. Not Patricia Lockwood, who has become the hottest young poet on the literary landscape. Patricia Lockwood was born in a trailer in the Midwest. She never went to college. Last year, one of her poems called Rape Joke quickly received 100,000 likes on Facebook. She's also found an ardent audience on Twitter where her steady stream of surreal, sexually explicit humor has won her over 30,000 followers and a string of admirers in the world of comedy. Patricia Lockwood is here tonight with her new collection, Motherland, Fatherland, Homeland Sexuals. Please join me in welcoming her to the JCCSF. Okay, so I'm, I'm wearing a special tiara that can hear me. This is how it's been explained to me. There are like little hooks over my ears, and I just set this right here, and I'm not going to break it, no matter what, <laughs> because it's very expensive equipment for a very expensive community center. Okay, now, <laughs> when I got here, they asked me if I needed anything, and they said, you know, we can get you some food, we can get you coffee, we can get you, uh, you know, like, <laughs> we can get you whiskey. And I say, you have whiskey? Okay, I'll have whiskey. And so she comes back and she's literally like, she was holding them like this, all three. And one of them, how is this even pronounced? The Balvenie. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, this is scotch. She recommends that I slam this one. Yeah, we'll see. I'll take a vote. We have crown. <laughs> we have a bottle of crown for me. Now, I don't know, can I, is this something I can handle? This is Canadian. <laughs> and then this, this is the one that has the most in it. So what, is that what I should do? All right, we're putting it to a vote. All right. This. Oh, is this like a, an applause meter? No. <laughs> You raise your hands for me. That's what you do. <laughs> okay, so that was like mediocre applause. The crown, one girl in the back. She rides hard for crown, okay. All right, I'm, I'm paying attention to you. All right, and then what about this? That seems like more, oh, because you guys are hip. Okay, all right, but the other question is how much of it should I have? All of it? Okay. All right, I propose a system where when I am reading, if someone feels like I need to take a drink, you go, Kahoo! or like, you know, a bird, like, Kahoo! or like, hoo hoo. Or can you do any other bird noises? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, there's like a bird genius in the front. Okay, do it, do more. What the hell? Okay, so how do you learn how to do that? God, there's like two of you. I don't even, I'm like, this is freaking me out. This, is this you? Are you making these bird noises? So how do you do it? And also, like, what kind of a teenagerhood did you have that you got really into that? And that's like something you taught yourself how to do. Is that enough? I mean, I don't even know how much people drink of anything. Is that a lot? I'm not going to have that much. I'll water the plants with it in front afterwards. Yeah, so no, seriously, how do you learn to do that? Were you like that guy who was on those cop movies and he was like, blah, 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 and obviously I did not get into that because I can't do any of them? Was it like that? Uh, no, I was never that good. Well, I'm just saying, is it like a similar impulse? I guess. Okay, I mean, because I need to know. I don't understand you sound people, like, at all. <laughs> now, something hilarious happened. Okay, I've never been in San Francisco before. I'm just here for, like, one day. It's cool. Is it cool? Do you guys like it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're supposed to, like, give it up for your city. Come on, yeah, thank you, thank you. But yeah, I was just here for the one day, and I got in, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm all ready to read. And they were like, oh, no, you're going to lecture. And I was like, Whoa, no, no. And then I said, oh, you can't do that when you're wearing a tiara that can hear you. 
Is that better? Is that good? We got it? All right, I haven't killed it. So I said if I gave a lecture, it would be one of those lectures where people came away knowing less than they did in the first place. So I was like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix it, and I'm going to do some readings, and then we're going to do a Q&A at the end. And for any of you who have come in late, if you make a bird noise at me as I'm reading, I will take a drink of this bourbon. And that's my promise to you. All right, let's get started. <laughs> now, I do know that San Francisco is a food town. Is this right? Yeah. You guys, this is like a major foodie town. So I thought it would probably be good to read some really good food writing that you guys might like. I recently did a food diary for Grub Street, and I like to think that I broke new ground in the form. <laughs> so I will be reading that to start with. Should I take a drink first? One tiny? Thank you. Thank you. That's what I need. I need this participation. That's so good. <laughs> Let me put that there. All right. My food diary. Keep in mind that I live in Kansas. It will explain a lot of this. Friday, August 22nd. No breakfast. Breakfast is a fool's meal, and I would rather be poisoned than eat a single bite of breakfast. Everything about it is baby food, except for the vulgar American meats, which seem to have been carved straight off Paul Bunyan's own ass. Eggs are just a shape, and toast is the reason the British no longer rule the world. Too cozy and complacent. I do drink a coffee, though. I'm not going to pretend the Enlightenment didn't happen. 12 p.m. I drink another coffee. Actually, I drink three more coffees. Am I supposed to be talking about all the coffee I'm drinking? That would take up too much space, I fear. Assume I drink so much coffee that sometimes I pretend that it's gas, and I'm a little diesel truck that needs to get all the way across the country with my load. 2 p.m. I sit in my backyard eating a chicken sandwich and sighing tragically after every bite. The sandwich is as cold as the universe. Here's the thing. I don't need to be rich. I just need to make enough money so that I can sometimes eat at one of those places that makes your sandwich hot for you. <laughs> I don't know why, but it seems so hard to make your sandwich hot at home. <laughs> Even though it should be easy. 8.30 <laughs> p.m. I make it a habit to eat whatever's in the books I'm reading. This means chowder for Moby Dick. Mixed grill for the corrections, mushrooms and sour cream for speak memory, and a hamburger with french fries for Ramona Quimby, age eight. <laughs> it, mean, it means that whenever I read Redwall, I go out into the yard and eat flowers. <laughs> Be careful with this. There are deterras in my yard, and if I accidentally eat one of these, I am told I will experience a vision quest in the manner of Ayla from the Clan of the Cave Bear books. Right now, I'm reading the new Murakami, which means I eat pasta while listening to classical music and thinking about cats and wondering what it would be like to live down in a well. <laughs> I bet I would love it. 12 a.m. Oh, no. It's PMS. You know what this means. I have to eat an entire jar of capers one by one with a shrimp fork at midnight. <laughs> that was only the first day. Saturday, August 23rd, 2 p.m. Fine. I'll submit myself to the indignity of breakfast. I'll eat a, a yogurt. What is yogurt? Is the yogurt having sex in my mouth as I eat it? Is it some sort of dairy orgy? Maybe that's why the women in the commercials always make such sensual faces as they slide the spoon of demon curd in and out of their mouths. The yogurt claims to be Greek, but I don't know why. Perhaps a centaur drizzled honey over it with his tail. That would be Greek as hell. 7 p.m. Listen, I am writing a book. I don't have time for meals. And why haven't we reached a Jetsons point yet where everything we need is in capsules? I want to die. Oh, 
My husband Jason arrives home at the crucial psychological moment, rushes into my study and drops a giant slice of fruit tart in my mouth before either of us can say a word. My death is averted. For now. 9.30 p.m. I consider myself to be crunch punk, which means that if I don't hear my food crunching, I starve. I haven't crunched anything all day, so in order to keep myself mentally and physically hearty, I eat approximately 100 potato chips. 11 p.m. I sip a mug of Kratom tea, which is a legal vitamin that makes music sound better to people. It also makes you very hungry. Under its influence, I wolf an enormous turkey sandwich while listening to brain salad surgery and become one with the glittering cosmos. My mouth glistens with a galaxy of mayonnaise. Turkey is a dinosaur, I think, disoriented, and fall asleep dreaming of myself flying a turkey dactyl so close to the sun that it becomes perfectly roasted and embraces me with a pair of enormous brown drumsticks. Food is truly a miracle. Sunday, August 24th, 11.30 a.m. A handful of craisins, the clit of fruit. <laughs> 3 p.m. I watch Tom Popo while eating ramen. Yes, I do eat ramen every day because I am a student of life. What is going on with that one scene where the guy puts a live prawn on a woman's bare stomach and lets it wiggle around until she climaxes? How do I figure out how to do that at home? 5.30 p.m. Time for a purse surprise. Purse surprise is where you open up your purse and just eat anything that's accumulated in it over the past few weeks. I get lucky this time. Five beef sticks, three oranges, a box of mints, two coffee truffles, and a pill that could honestly be anything. 7 p.m. All I eat for dinner is the internet. It tastes awful. <laughs> After midnight, gremlin time. I Google the words, can you be addicted to Snapple Mango Madness? And come upon a bunch of pregnant women talking about the new sinister hold that Snapple has on them. If it turned out I were pregnant and the only symptom I had was that I was suddenly addicted to Snapple and I wanted to drink 10 a day until a pure tropical baby fell out of me, this would be the best ad campaign Snapple ever had. I better get started. I drink a Snapple Mango Madness. Monday, August 25th. My husband has long dreamed of opening up a restaurant called Jason's Gross where he only serves things that sound good to him, such as pizza with pepperoni and strawberries and mashed potato sundaes, which I don't have the heart to even inquire about. Today, I tell him I will eat anything he makes. He rubs his hands together with glee and begins to write out a menu. Throughout the course of the day, he serves me raw banana in elegant slices, futuristic protein bar that resembles an astronaut BM, Pretzels with ketchup. No one ever tries it, but it's good. <laughs> Quinoa mound with pubic sprouts. Erotic meal. <laughs> Brava, I tell him, dabbing my lips with a linen napkin. Jason is indeed gross. <laughs> Not wanting to hurt his feelings, I sneak into the kitchen at midnight and eat like an entire rotisserie chicken. Tuesday, August 26th. This diary would be a waste if I didn't get drunk at least once with my mom. We head out to an Italian restaurant in Kansas City called Bella Napoli and order artichoke and smoked mozzarella pizzas and a bottle of white wine. Jason isn't drinking wine right now because he is healthy, so my mom and I have the bottle all to ourselves. This is good until she drinks a second glass and decides to tell us the story of a man who just died in a tragic cliff diving accident. He was so fun-loving, and it ultimately killed him, she says. The pizza falls out of my mouth. My fork clatters to the table. We exit the restaurant with tears in our eyes. To cheer us all up, I force us to go to the local Baskin Robbins and order daiquiri ices. 
I haven't eaten one of these since high school, and it tastes much more synthetic than I remember. Jason's face, as he samples it, recalls one of those YouTube videos of a baby eating a lemon for the first time. <laughs> he shudders. His expression passes through stages of betrayal, disgust, anger at God. It tastes like going down on a My Little Pony, he says finally. <laughs> Does this contain corn syrup, my mother shrieks? Because that makes me misbehave. <laughs> and sure enough, before we know it, she has hurled her cone into the trash, raced out of the Baskin Robbins, and jumped into her car. She's freaking out on corn, flooring it through every yellow light she passes, and telling us a story about how her father once ate 30 ears of corn in a cornfield and then threw up. It's why I can't tolerate corn, she yells at the top of her lungs. Soon enough, it becomes clear where we're going, to the Cheesecake Factory, the locus of her existence, to get some iced tea. The Cheesecake Factory is terrifying for several reasons. First, because factory implies the existence of a Willy Wonka running around in the bowels of the restaurant. This is huge. He's wearing a giant hat in the shape of a genital lily. He's juggling balls of fried mac and cheese. He's experimenting with hideous new skinny-licious concoctions, and he's taking bad children on canal rides. Second, because why not call it what it is? Vagina hallucinations in Byzantium. I'm somehow hungry again, so I eat, it grieves me to report, a plate of desecrated chicken tendies that have been breaded with crushed pretzels. Why? Who had this idea? No one knows, but far off in the distance, I am sure I can hear Willy Wonka laughing. No one made a bird noise. No one made like a single bird noise. Does anyone want to make a bird noise now? What? Who was that? Raise your hand, sir. I think that was you. That was like a raven. What was it? Ah, do it again. Oh, what? Oh, it was a turkey dactyl, like what I just read about. Okay, so I'm, I am taking another drink now. Mm. So, oh boy, you don't start talking again right as it's in your throat because you, it won't come out correctly. So those of you who have been following me on Twitter know that about a year ago, we ran into some financial difficulties, my husband and I. He had some, some health problems. We had to move back in with my parents, and that is a really fucked up thing for anyone in the world to ever have to do. So I thought literally the only way I can make this better is if, you know, I'm writing about it. So I started to write a book. And I'm calling it Priest Daddy because my dad is a married Catholic priest, which is like the whole weird thing about it. Um, but actually the true star of the book is my mom, as you might have gathered from that previous chapter. Like everything you do with her is so textual and literary that you cannot freaking believe it. Here follows the extremely true, the more than true story. What, how can it be more than true? It's like, it's true, but it's also more than true. This is the story of us staying in a hotel one night when we were driving down to Nashville. My mother encounters a foreign substance on the bed, and the rest of our night and our lives is ruined. It's called the Come Queens of Hyatt Place. If anyone is not in the mood to hear the word come honestly recited like a hundred times in a row, I just urge you to get out while you can, because that is what this is going to be. <laughs> the come queens of Hyatt Place. All year long I have found myself as ubiquitously in hotel rooms as the Gideon Bible. I have sat in the light of hotel lamps and switched myself on and observed. I know all the soaps. I know all the shower heads. I know that the most popular hotel paintings are Beach After Everyone is Dead, <laughs> Beige Interpretation of the Rage of a Cat, Squares Going Wild, <laughs> and A Rose's Period. 
One by one I have pocketed the complimentary pens, and one by one I have memorized the mottos on the stationery. Leave a trail of genius, the Marriott note paper tells me, which is so wildly optimistic that it's actually touching. <laughs> All year long I have sat in hotel rooms and nothing has happened to write home about, which is the beauty of hotel rooms, really. Tonight, however, is different. Tonight is different because my mom believes there is cum on the hotel bed. <laughs> I am in Nashville, and it is midnight, and my mom believes there is cum on the hotel bed. We are driving from Kansas City down to Savannah, and we stop over for the night in what we believe to be a city of rhinestones and cowboy boots and blonde hair and wholesomeness. Instead, we find ourselves in the cum capital of America. <laughs> it happens this way. After driving all day, after getting lost on our way into town, after a steak dinner at a local roadhouse staffed entirely with aspiring country singers, we feel that we have earned our rest. We check into our room at the Hyatt Place, and we wash our similar faces, and change into our respective pajamas, and we yawn identical yawns, and then, as it sometimes does, the whole world stops spinning on a single second. My mother turns back the blanket and gasps. From the look on her face, I can tell she has seen cum. <laughs> She throws back her head and howls. And the sound chills me to the bone. I hear you. It is the consciousness of a thousand comes crying out for a body. <laughs> this is a Catholic's worst nightmare. Souls all over the bed. <laughs> Touch it, she commands. Touch it and tell me what that is. <laughs> I silently beg the fourth commandment to release me just this once from its power. Is this how God wants me to honor my mother? By touching half of a stranger's baby on a hotel mattress? When Moses came down from the mountaintop, did he make the people touch it? I pause so long I get something pregnant. Mom, I'm not gonna touch cum. Just touch the cum and tell me if it's cum. <laughs> Please don't make me touch the cum. If I hadn't touched the cum, then you would never have been born. <laughs> One look at her tells me I have no choice. I reach out a trembling hand and suddenly she changes her mind. No, 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 wait! Before you touch it, get on your internet and Google how long does cum stay alive? <laughs> Mom, you're a Catholic. Isn't that one of the main things you're supposed to know? <laughs> Haven't you guys written entire books about how long cum lives? I can't remember right now. Just look it up. We need to know. According to the internet, there are two possibilities. Sperm either die shortly after they leave the body, or else they live eternally. First on earth and then in heaven. Banging themselves adoringly against the great gold egg of God's face. No one can decide. I can't handle this on my own. So I head over to Twitter and I start sending out bulletins about my current situation as fast as I can type them. I start at the beginning and waste no words. My mom believes there is cum on the hotel bed and she's trying to make me touch it to verify that it is cum. No, mom. No, I will not. Immediately, one of my friends responds, touch the cum. <laughs> touch the cum with your mom. <laughs> Pathetic fallacy is real. So just at that moment, a storm begins to beat itself against the window. Thunder bears its crack to us, and raindrops wiggle their long tails down the glass. Lightning shoots down the sky and illuminates us, and I see that my mother has undergone a change. Her eyes are open so wide it is impossible to imagine them ever closing. 
Her hair runs in wild locks away from her forehead. She looks like Edgar Allan Poe, haunted by cum, <laughs> chased through the slick streets at night by cum. She shivers as if someone just came on her grave. <laughs> An unmistakable look begins to tiptoe across her face. I know that look. All of her children know it. We saw it bending over us tenderly when we were babies in our beds. It's her let's call the police look. <laughs> Mom, no. Can't we call the police just a little bit? We are not calling the police. There is no special cum division. She eyes the distance between herself and the phone and then somersaults across the bed. It's a nimble move. The move of a burglar on her way to steal a Pollock from the Met. If the police won't help her, she's going to take matters into her own hands. She rises up out of the somersault with cat-like grace, snatches up the phone, and starts to dial the front desk, but I see where this is going and wrestle it bodily away from her. I was once forced to switch hotel rooms at midnight because she saw a pube on the bathroom floor, and I swore to myself I would never let that happen again. <laughs> Pubes aren't contagious, I told her. Then why do we all have them, she retorted. <laughs> I slam the phone back down and we stand staring at each other, panting like we're turned on. Craftily, she decides to switch tactics. Do you think that I am overreacting? I consider my answer carefully. My mother's reactions are very often indistinguishable from demonic possession, but it isn't always wise to say so. She presses on. I guess a fun mother wouldn't care about all the cum. <laughs> I think a fun mother would care the most about it. <laughs> Bingo. That's right. Because you can't have fun if you know that somewhere in the world someone is being disgusting. Thank God she doesn't know how to use the internet. She would never have fun again. Mom, it's late. Let's just sleep on the cum beds. Let's just sleep on these cummy, cummy beds. <laughs> Trisha, she says, beds are supposed to be comfy, not cummy. <laughs> oh my God, she really is my mother. <laughs> there were times in the past when I had my doubts, but no longer. I have gazed into a puddle of genetic matter and seen my own DNA. We are more related than we've ever been. We are the cum queens of Hyatt Place. All opposition between us dissolves, and we find ourselves in perfect cooperation. We hide the spot with a fresh white hotel towel, and then lie awake for the next hour making cum puns to each other. How did we end up here? There was a moment when she first turned back that blanket, when we looked into each other's eyes, and a blue current crackled between us, and our bodies made a sudden decision we were going to say the word come to each other. It had to be done. The story had given us no choice. There was no turning back. Who did it, we wonder? She thinks it must have been a pervert who gets off on voyeurism of porno. <laughs> but I think it was probably a businessman with a hotel fetish who shouted the word amenities as he came. <laughs> A business man, you mean, she says. And I'm so proud that I feel like I just taught a baby how to read. <laughs> After a while, I start to drift off, but I can feel her eyes burning a hole into my left cheek. She's awake. She will be awake forever. Tracia, she whispers. I can't fall asleep. I'm afraid to turn around and face the cum. <laughs> The next morning, she stomps down to the front desk and registers a complaint about the amount of semen in our room. <laughs> the ideal amount of semen in a hotel room being none, the amount in our room qualifying as an actual wad. <laughs> she has never felt more alive, you can tell. She is enjoying herself with all the immensity of a recently inseminated elephant. She inserts the phrase, come on, into the conversation wherever possible, and when the concierge attempts to make excuses, she tells her not to give her that load. <laughs> the concierge's face is serene, 
so serene that I become suspicious. Perhaps she is the comer. A concierge sounds like a person who comes on beds. Maybe she got to be the concierge because she was able to come on more beds in one night than any other employee. I believe it, actually. I have never had a job in my life, so this scenario seems plausible to me. <laughs> in my secret heart, I believe that this is how the president is elected. <laughs> my mother continues to talk, sounding more persuasive with every second. If Daisy's voice was full of money, my mother's voice is full of coupons for free appetizers. She once sent back a piece of Weight Watchers cake because it was too small. And the waitress ended up giving her three additional pieces of Weight Watchers cake to take home. If you think that defeats the whole purpose of Weight Watchers, then you're not paying attention. The point is that my mom wasn't even trying to lose weight. Let me get the manager, the concierge says at last. I'm not capable of listening to the story one more time, so I slip outside and watch the interaction through a window, concealing myself behind a large potted palm. The manager looks to be an ordinary woman, but not for long. The scene begins to unfold, and it's more dramatic than even I expected. My mother is starring in a one-woman play called Biohazard, and the critics are loving it. <laughs> Unable to capture the full feeling of the experience with words, she resorts to interpretive dance, throwing back her head, making jack-off gestures, leaping back in horror, and finally shaking both fists at God. At one point, she appears to yelp, like a guard dog who has been trained to bark whenever cum gets near it. The manager watches in a trance. She's completely caught up in the drama. She needs to know what happened next. What happened next is that your hotel ejaculated on my mother. The manager's mouth falls open. She begins to shuffle paper. She begins to tap keys. Now she's taking my mother's hand, and my mother is squeezing it gratefully, as if to say that she might recover someday with the help of the purest, most asexual angels. But that day will be a long time coming. She dabs at her eyes with a Kleenex, as if to say that she can never wipe away what she saw. My mother walks through the sliding doors triumphant and informs me that we have been awarded a staggering 10,000 Hyatt points for our trauma. If you're not familiar with the Hyatt points system, that's like the most you can get. This means that we get to stay in the Cum Hotel again the next night, except this time, it's free. Success. We join hands and set forth into the morning, united by that human glue which cannot be dissolved. I wasn't lying, it really is just the word cum. I'm just repeating cum over and over again. I noticed that there were no like Birdman noises. Can anyone do a new one? Is that you again? Tired of you, tired of you. No more bird noises from this guy. Anybody else? That was you again. That was you. I have a hard time. It's very bright up here, actually. It's difficult to tell where noises are coming from, which quadrant. All right, somebody give me an eagle. <laughs> Do you not love America in this room? Because that is our national bird, I'm pretty sure. And what sound does it make? It's like a roar, I think. I'm pretty sure it's a roar. Mm. I've actually had very little of this, but I think it's improved the sort of flow and lubrication of the conversation. But I probably would be remiss if I did not read any poetry at all, so like, put your seatbelts on, because I know, I hate it just as much as you do. Um, but that's, that's what we gotta do when we're in this business, you know? You get up in the morning and you go read poetry to people who hate it, and that's what I'm gonna do tonight. I think I'll read The Father and Mother of American Tit Picks. This is very serious, so if you laugh, I will be enraged. And I will come down and strike you off your little chairs and kick you out, and you won't even get a book for your trouble. Oh yeah, I have had some bourbon, sorry. Don't, that, that's enough of that. The Father and Mother of American Tit Picks. The Father and Mother of American Poetry are back from the dead for just one day. They are standing up out of their graves turning to each other, exchanging their tit picks, and then retreating back into the earth in their silence, 
and the handfuls of dust all over them that were not their tits at all. Thank God they were able to do this, or we might never have known what the tits of them looked like. When you want to say a poet is mysterious, say, very few tit pics of him exist, <laughs> or reading his letters and journals, we are able to piece together a pic of his tits. They loved butter and radishes and were devoted to his sister. Neither of the poets were transcendentalists, but their tit pics rose up and floated over all and filled up the sky with rose-colored clouds. I admit that I brought them back from the dead because I was standing in front of the mirror taking picture after picture of my tits in order to establish for once in all time what a tit actually looks like, since according to the dictionary, lots of things can be a tit, even including a bird and an idiot. Thank you. I was hoping for that. I have birds and idiots all over my body, but not where my pecs are. I shouted. I was furious. Let me set down the meaning of the tit and get the last word on it. Commence me taking hundreds of boob photos and studying them closely and thinking most of these don't even look like boobs. They look like birds and idiots. <laughs> and I thought, this is not something Emily Dickinson would have done. Or is it? <laughs> Emily Dickinson was the father of American poetry and Walt Whitman was the mother, suckling grizzled wild dogs at his teats. Walt Whitman nude in the forest, staring deep into a still pool, the only means of taking tit pics available at that time. <laughs> Too many people fell in and drowned in that age before we learned to really swim in the tit pic. Raindrops fell into the still pool of the tit pick, rippling it outward and jiggling it, since the jiggle within the tit pick is what we're really after. The wild dogs, they grew up and grew tame and learned to be owned by American poets and take them for walks around lakes, as a poet isn't happy unless he's walking in a circle with the double meaning of the word tit just bouncing away on his chest and meaning on the writing wobbling there, like Walt Whitman's tits on the lake how beautiful, almost like a part of nature. Walt Whitman with a bra on his head, which is keeping his thoughts from being totally bare. The bra is too small, and the bra is made of lace, and his friends are saying, Walt, you are falling out. <laughs> and wow, Walt, you are giving everyone a show. <laughs> and why are you giving away the cow for free when I only wanted to hear the moo? Still, I mean, it's been years, and I still don't know what that line means. The boys, when looking at Walt Whitman, would nudge each other and say, a body like that could never drown. Meaning I guess that his boobs would float him? Or that his lungs were really big so there had to be a lot of breath in them? I never really understood that one. Or when he was riding the ferry and leaning over to look at the glittering river, the boys would nudge each other and holler, careful not to tip over with those huge jugs, Walt. But wouldn't his huge jugs just scoop up the water till the river was dry? And then he would go walking home on the riverbed with his triumphant jugs balanced in front of him, threatening to spill, but not spilling a drop and even the glitter still intact in them? The gulf between a word and what it represents is still so great, but a shocking reflection of perfect tits floats and will always float there. What I am trying to say is that metaphors are dangerous. If teeth are like pearls, and if skin is like a pearl, and if the gates of heaven were 12 pearls, imagine the pearl explosion that would happen if someone bit their own boob in the afterlife, which we have to assume Walt Whitman is doing to make St. Peter upset, which is not very mature, but I'll tell you what is mature. Walt Whitman's incredible boobs. <laughs> I mean, he's had 200 years to develop them. Perhaps that's why breasts have gotten bigger, because American poetry is accumulating in our lungs and has to push its way out somehow. But back to how metaphors are dangerous. When he is old, his boobs will seem to him like raindrops trickling down and attempting to join a larger body of water. 
Thank goodness they are trickling down a window so all of us can see it happen. And we are a girl, and we're reading a book as the human rain pours relentlessly down. Emily Dickinson, for instance, the father of American poetry, is reading Shakespeare there just through the window. And her own body is so fierce and so hot that any droplets that landed there would instantly burn up. Emily has a beautiful black and white beard that reaches down to the ground, and lightning streaks zigzag out of her mouth. This is disputed by her photographs, but her photographs know nothing, and half of them aren't even her. The beard flows over her chest, and to look at it is literacy, since the handwriting found in the beards of the past was so curling and flourishing and so feminine, everyone could read it. When she trims the beard, the trimmings fall onto the page and never move again except the dashes, which rearrange themselves in the night. We have thought two things about her. One, that she was a little woman prune, and two, that she was an almost mentally overripe plum that was bursting all over the place and calling the wasps to it. The general assumption has been that her tit picks would not be worth looking at if they existed at all, which is false. <laughs> Since I have secret information that they were actually four-dimensional and measured in minutes rather than cups, and wouldn't you like to get a load of those deep and boundless pools of time? Though maybe you think time doesn't exist, and that's where you got the idea that she was unblessed in the boob department. <laughs> what I'm saying is that her boobs were so big they were practically geological ages, and the beard of Father Time flowed over them. The reason she always wore a white dress, for instance, is so that men would every minute be aware of the soft mounds of time shining through them. Eyes up here, buddy she would say, when their eyes drifted down and lingered on the white and pulsing handfuls of time and beheld them with huge hunger to touch all the little milliseconds at once. Wow, disrespectful, she once shouted when Stephen Crane burst into her house and grabbed a fistful of her and then dropped dead. <laughs> Too young to hold so much heart-stopping boob of existence in his hand. Tits roam the earth in search of a body and they knock on Emily Dickinson's door, but we'll never know what they said to each other, and the sound of the knocker itself was so soft. The ideal tit would be so big that it would include everything else in it, and you would be part of it, and you would be surrounded by it, and it would be wet and nude and in a white bikini that would see through enough to show you and leave nothing of you to the imagination right down to the goosebumps you got in church. Is it cold in here? Men shout to the boob that contains them. Careful not to put my eye out with that thing. They shout to the boob that contains them just before the darkness closes over. There is felt to be a huge heartbeat just beyond them. On her deathbed, Emily Dickinson whispered, destroy the negatives of my tit pics. <laughs> the ones where they look like moon rocks or else people will think I was from outer space. Her ideas are often spoken of as being out to here, accompanied by an exaggerated juggy motion of the hands. The hands bounced up and down slowly to imply heaviness. Picture her hidden breast and a shocking tan line on it, from even she knows not where, from a sun inside her dress. Who is not an atheist about Emily Dickinson's body, which is totally unbelievable? It is the number one beach body every year for the way the letters wash up on it. While Whitman is the number two beach body every year because look at the way he snapped back into shape only months after giving birth to American poetry. <laughs> In order to sing louder, pretend you are singing to someone across the room. In order to get bigger tits, pretend they are five minutes ahead of you into the future. Pretend that more than the rest of you, they move around the sun. Mommy, cried the men to the boobs of Emily Dickinson. Did someone say mommy? While Whitman shouted, kicking open the door of his body and running into the room of hers. I am the dad here, Emily Dickinson said gracefully, rearranging the black and white curls of her beard. I'm the goddamn mom, while Whitman bellowed, detaching a dog from one of his breasts and throwing it into the crowd, where it woofed tremendously among the sexists. 
They exactly exchanged their gazes. Well, time to die, Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson said to each other. And they fell backwards at exactly the same moment, toppled at last by their tits which stood upright with nipples like perfect pink erasers. Both of them naked, and arrayed in all the invisible words, like said, and just, and and, and oh, which are there but the reader never sees them. Above them floating their titpicks, and floating above their titpicks our eyes. That's about 45 minutes, so we can do a Q&A if we want. You want to, yeah, you can have the bourbon too. There's actually a lot of it here. <laughs> I've only had a little bit, but you would think it was more. <laughs> so just put your hand up if you have a question or comment. Shall I, where shall I, shall I move Well, no, no, you people? stay there. I stay here, no. We'll find don't you. Move among the don't people. be shy. Questions. Don't be shy at all. It can be a comment. It, it can, can be a, a question. It can be a bird sound. It can be a request. It can be... It can be a request. I'm yeah, sure. you do request. Anything. I absolutely do request, 100%. Oh, yes, here we go. Here we go. do wait, it. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, if you do request. I came across a poem of yours. Yeah. I think it was called, it was about a Bible. Oh, the I, Bible, do I don't have that with oh. me. But you know what, um, are you on Twitter? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm like, what if, if it's not that on the one. internet? Like, does it exist? Um, it was originally published in Tin House. I couldn't remember. Okay. Yes, it was in Tin House. So if you contact them, they can definitely, you can find it. Or even just like write to them and they can get you a copy. But you're right, I should put that in here. Were you at the Green Dragon reading in Boston? Because I did read it there and that was fun. That was very obscene. Yeah. Okay. It was good. You guys missed it. So feel sorry for yourselves. We have a question back here. Oh, nice. Hi. Um, who are your favorite poets and influences? Who should we know about that you like? You know, I was a person who actually did not have a wide range of reading matter available to me. So I read a lot of things like the Bible, for instance. I mean, I like a shit ton of the Bible. I've read so much of the Bible. And obviously, there's a very strong lyric voice there. So that was probably my earliest. Later, I found the modernist because anything beyond that had been burned probably in all Catholic libraries and high schools like that I attended. So they weren't even available to me. Like, we didn't even get those poems where that little guy was the cockroach, you know, like typing on the, the, the typewriter and like making the little poems. We didn't even get that. So for me, it was like, it was Wallace Stevens, it was Elizabeth Bishop, it was Rilke. It was a lot of like very traditional, like old establishment poets who still do have a lot of music to them. I still resonate, I think, much more to the modernists than I do to anything that came after them. But what happens then, if you cut your teeth on the modernist, you become a postmodernist yourself. That's what sucks about it. You can't be a modernist now because they're all dead. So the only thing left to be is post, 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 and post, 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 post. Other questions? Or yeah, I need, I need questions from Twitter people because I know you're here. Okay, really good. Here you are. Thank I can't you. see very well. Uh, how did you feel oh. about the... Oh, sorry. My TR is coming off. I need to like have someone put it on me. It's insane. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's better now. Yeah, I feel it. Yes. How did you feel about uh, that one commenter on your Grub Street article who was disappointed? The one? Yeah. Dude, there were like a hundred of them. For some freaking reason that I will never be able to pinpoint or elucidate or anything like that, that was the most controversial thing I have ever written in my life. I'm like, really? You guys, this is just about like me eating chips in Kansas, but that's what they hated. I was like, I don't order anything from Seamless. I actually, it made me seem like I knew less about food than I actually did. My friend wrote me and he was like, you actually, it's, it, it's like you got paid to taste food for the first time <laughs> and write about it. And I was like, yeah, that's fair. I mean, that is honestly fair. But if you're talking about Perky Sandra D, Perky Sandra D was very disappointed by my Grub Street Diary because as she wrote, she lives in a small town and there's not, her life is drab and she looks forward to it every week to escape into the glamorous life of the person writing the Grub Street Diary. Very obviously I was not being glamorous in my diary. So she was traumatized by that. She was enraged as well. And I think she actually came to the uh, Grub Street Diary the next week and was like, well, this is more like it, Patricia Lockwood. Several people did that. I will never know. Can anyone tell me like what 
what made people so mad? Does anyone know? Does anyone know? <laughs> oh, he knows. It's him again. Uh, I think the essential question of the internet is yeah. uh, why wasn't why, I consulted? Yes, and yeah. why <laughs> this was put here to make me angry. It's really true. But you know, usually I'm not just, you know, not to judge, but it usually more often is dudes. I was very surprised that a woman who called herself Perky Sandra D was so <laughs> mad about that. She was like a volcano of rage about like my food diary. Poor thing. R.I.P. R.I.P. Perky Sandra D. Hey. Um, the Duke. How are you doing? <laughs> Speaking of consulting the internet, you yeah. once crowdsourced, which is probably my favorite verb. Yeah, no, it's a good uh, verb. Great uh, verb. <laughs> a poem uh, from a bunch of jackasses on Twitter. Jackasses, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering how that went. Live uh, new dads. Just talk about what that was like on the other side, because I tried to participate. but uh, Well, part of that was like I had two hashtags going, because I don't really understand Twitter. That's the secret. I don't know what's going on on it. That's why I'm like, everyone loves it, because they're like, oh, she's trolling us. I'm like, no, I'm an idiot, okay? <laughs> so basically what happened was that after the New York Times Magazine profile of me came out, they were like, well, we think it would be real fun if we uh, just sort of like did something viral with you uh, for the media and content as well. And I was like, that does sound good. <laughs> that sounds good to me. <laughs> So yeah, hook it up. And they were like, why don't you write a poem with everyone on Twitter? And I was like, dude, this is the worst. Have you ever been on Twitter? Do you know how that would end up? So I thought, what I gotta do is game it from the start. You gotta, you just have to game it from the start. So I was like, all right, it's gonna be about dads because they are the people who read the New York Times. They do it when they're naked and they are alive because all of us want our fathers to be here with us on the planet Earth and not deep in a cold grave. So. There was my idea, obviously. And as we know, as you would know, people like John Hendren have made it a special point of interest of theirs to you know, follow the nude dads of the internet. So there was a pre-existing model as well. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna do this. You, if, the old grade lady, if the old grade lady asks you to do something, you do it. Like, there's no choices. You don't get a choice. So I was like, yeah, I'll definitely write a poem about nude dads for you online. Um, so I set up a hashtag, and I did get just the worst that you would believe, but I also got some good stuff. But it was almost more unintentional. It was like da-da. It was very stressful. And I like hadn't showered yet, and I was like sweating poisonously as I did it. Because I was so afraid I was going to miss an amazing line of American poetry and not be able to put it in my live nude dad's poem. And, and I, I, I would like have let the muse down. So I felt that I really stayed on my game. I had a huge Red Bull at the time. It was like as tall as my bod. And I was drinking it. And I think that that contributed to it being really the excellent poem that it was. I think we can all agree that it ended up gorgeous. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. Come on. You can do it. Oh, yes. Well, I just have a very conventional question. Oh, sure. Um, I'm just curious what your writing process is mm. and how do you get inspired and or do you, yeah. It's my favorite question actually. I don't like writers who shit on that. I'm sorry, but like my favorite thing to do as a writer is to read about what kind of pens the other writers are using. Maybe that makes me fake and bad. I don't even care. So what I do is I never leave my house <laughs> and I actually don't even leave my bed. Here's the situation. So we were renting the, uh, the lower floor of a house in Lawrence, Kansas for a while. Then the lady upstairs moved out. And we got the whole house and I fucking flipped out because I, I, I was like, have I ever even lived in a whole house before? What do you do with all this space? And I went insane. And so what I did was I moved into a tiny little closet upstairs and basically never left it. I could feel my body trying to bilocate and be in different rooms of the house at once. And I was like, is this what people deal with when they're homeowners? The answer is no, it's just for insane people. It's just my problem. <laughs> so I'm in the bed. My husband brings me a cup of coffee because he's a, like a long suffering male wife. And so I sip the coffee and I read books. And I read books until you sort of catch on something or you find a trigger. And you're already working on a piece, so you're existing somewhere in the space or the location, like the country of that piece. You know, sort of like you're in a cloud and it's surrounding you, you're thinking about it, you're looking for things that can go in it. So what I do is I really narrow my focus. And so I'll be reading, it can be on the internet. The internet, is, does, it doesn't function as a piece of distraction to me. It helps because there are lots of things on it that I don't know shit about and I wouldn't know about them unless they, you know, the internet brought it to my attention. So I'm reading, I'm waiting for that trigger. When the trigger comes, 
I type into my Chromebook <laughs> as fast as I can, but I'm a slow worker. It's like, you know, 300 words maybe a day. With poetry, you feel really excited if you write a dozen words. You're like, yes, I wrote, like a, fr I wrote a metaphor for a leaf today. That was all I did. And you're like, yes. And then you're like, take me out for drinks. Let's celebrate. <laughs> but yeah, my basic answer is that I never see anyone. I, t I never answer my phone. That's, you have to stop doing that. If you have a phone, don't answer any more calls. Um, I would say don't use too many substances. Is that something you're in danger of? I would just say no, not so much of like the, the stank weed, uh, you know, the devil's uh, lipstick, all these sorts of, um, you know, Virgin Mary's powder. Don't do it. Tap into this. I don't know where that, I mean, that's the end of that one pretty much, yeah. Next question's back here. Oh, yeah. Um, so we were talking about dads. I always do a thing Twitter. where I'm like, hey, I don't know. I get really lazy at this point. And I'm like, hello, <laughs> proceed. Oh, I was just saying, I've been trying to explain Twitter to my dad for oh, like Oh, that six don't years. do that. Yeah, no, it won't. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Okay. Um, well, do you have any words of advice, or I just should just quit? No, you definitely shouldn't do that. And I say that as a dad. I say that as like a very womanly dad who exists in the world. I did not understand Twitter for a really, really long time. Well, but that's because, does he have an account? All right, he's not going to understand it unless he has an account. And what you do is you set up one for him, you show him how to use it, and you curate a list of things that he follows that's good. Because otherwise, your dad is just going to follow like CNN and like like Bill O'Reilly. I don't even know if he's on Twitter, but he will He'll find a way to follow him. And and just like you know things that are like retweeting things about like health foods. That's where they make the mistakes. So you set him up, you like have him follow Drill and people like that. You know. I'm not saying that he'll get it, but it might happen that there comes a knock on your door one day and it's a new bold dad wearing like very narrow pants <laughs> with some with like a a different kind of beard than he used to have, piercings where you m like might not expect them. And the question is are you ready for that? So you're asking me how do I turn my dad onto Twitter and my answer is are you sure you really want to? <laughs> Yeah, Birdman, one of the Birdmans. Birdman 2. Birdman um, number 2. I was curious if you could share any tips for writing a really good sext. Oh, man, that's just lightning in a bottle, man. Wait, are you talking, like, real ones? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have trouble with that? <laughs> Be honest with me. I, I, in your opinion, what <laughs> makes a really good sext? I'm still asking if this is a sexy kind or if it's my kind that is like about Count Chocula. <laughs> right. The kind I write is not sexy. That's what people get wrong. People are like, have you met this sexy young poet on Twitter? And, I'm sh and people actually come and read it and it's like so horrible. Everything I tweet is like has nothing to do with the human body at all. It's like cubes spinning in space with like cereal mascots inside them. So what happens is that you take generally two disparate things. You do um, juxtapositions, but it's more you you look at a couple of good ones that you like. You sort of see the format. You do Mad Libs with those. You plug in. This is really how it works. I mean, you could do this with lines of poetry too. You take out, you know, the really like the the locuses of of that actual line or that actual joke, and you replace them, and you see how that works. And that's sort of how you figure it out on your own. Like, what are you into sexually and <laughs> as a serial person? <laughs> so, it's the same. It's the same question, yeah. I want to remind you, Trisha Lockwood will be signing books in yeah. the atrium. I sign animals on them. Yeah. Thanks to all of you for coming. Most of all, thank you, Trisha Lockwood, for being <laughs> here tonight. <laughs>